Okay, hello everyone. Guys, lovely to meet you all for the first time. Um, so those, uh, those wise words um, from CJ earlier, I think are all ringing in our ears as we, as we begin this discussion. Um, I think it's really important to have a, a sort of a healthy dose of realism. There is so much hype around the RWA sector. There is so much potential. Uh, but as CJ pointed out, there are a lot of barriers to it as well. So I think we need to, I think we need to bear, bear, that, um, bear those words of his in mind. But um, I, want to, I want to ask the three of you what building RWA protocols looks like in Cosmos. So my, my sort of first question, and I, I, any of you three can pick this up if you want. Uh, Ethereum gets talked about a lot as an RWA chain. I believe the latest upgrade to Avalanche is very much focused on RWAs. So why build RWA infrastructure in Cosmos? Okay, I can go <laughs> first. Um, so one of the main reasons that we even started looking at Cosmos way about 18 months ago when we were building this out, um, trickled down to the fact that there is sovereignty at play, specifically when we're looking at RWAs. And real world assets, like, and I love the fact that we're going last because I got to hear every single facet of reasons why it may or may not work out, which is fantastic. So like she just said, everything can be tokenized, but not everything. If I were to have built on an L2 on Ethereum, when the regulators eventually figure out how data is propagated on a blockchain, we're a little way away from that. Then at that point in time, it becomes critical for us to realize that as and when regulation comes up from different jurisdictions, we need to have a validator set that's able to upgrade the entire ecosystem in the network as we go forward. Now, Ethereum or Solana are already great chains. Specific chains for specific use cases is what we're looking at. With the Cosmos ecosystem that we've been building out, we have a opportunity to create a philosophy in which compliance and crypto can coexist, and our validator set supports that. So everyone that's building with us in the network effect that we have going forward all believe in that, and that's only possible if we were building in Cosmos as opposed to an L2 or a DAP on Solana. So that's, that's where we're coming from. Okay, so, so sovereignty is a big, a big part of it. Um, yes, sovereignty is a big part of it. Data uh, is critical, and specifically when you, and there were a couple of cases that came up which said that um, once you put data on chain, I think it was um, from the panel, two panels ago, where they said that AI can decrypt anything, blockchain will always have it out there. So that means that as things evolve, we will need to be able to change that. And most people in crypto don't necessarily care about sovereignty, all they care about is when moon. Uh, so. To start with that, in a panel like this might make sense, but for the most part, as a crypto user, I don't think anyone cares about sovereignty as much. Yeah, I, think, I think for Providence Blockchain Foundation, our evolution was quite different. We started off on Hyperledger, and we started building out there, and we just got stuck in the mud. And uh, we looked around, we thought about going to Ethereum, we thought about building in a few places, and where Cosmos made most sense was its modularity, the ability to be sovereign, but not from a retail user perspective, but because one of the benefits of building on Providence Blockchain Foundation, if you're a traditional finance institution, is that you can, you can have the best of both worlds. So you can start off on a public blockchain if you um, are willing to take on that risk, but you have a lot, of, uh, a lot of people who want to dip their toes into the RWA and tokenization landscape, but uh, aren't going to do that on a public blockchain yet. So you can go on a private zone um, or a zone of Cosmos and be fully private up until the day that the regulatory clarity becomes uh, clear and you can effectively push the IBC button and be off to the races everywhere that you need to go. So you can have sovereignty, privacy, you can have a fully private blockchain up until the day that you no longer have to have that and then in a matter of minutes over something like Axelar or IBC, you can get to where you need to be. Exactly, and both Mantra and Provenance obviously have built RWA-focused chains in Cosmos, so great to hear their input. I think just from a general builder perspective, back in the day when we were building Axelar, almost four years, almost five years at this point, there were not even that many options. Right? It was either like Polkadot or Cosmos, and after like technical evaluation, it was pretty clear that Cosmos was the most robust, robust stack. You have modularity, you have the ability to customize the stack as much as you want, which is something we really needed with Axelar. And even fast forward today, there are not that many options. 
right? Yeah. Um, you know, L2s, we start, we start seeing some custom L2s, but again, if you need certain opcodes, if you need to have your own validator set, if you need privacy, these things are much easier to do with Cosmos, and it's the most robust stack. It's been around for like, I don't know, six, seven years at this point, so why take the risk? Work with a different solution when you can use the battle-tested Cosmos stack that so many other projects have been using for a long time. Okay. So, so there's my answer to the question, why Cosmos? Now, what I'm working on kind of fit in, not just to, not just to Cosmos generally, but more, more um, specifically to the RWA niche and the RWA niche on Cosmos. So, Jay, can I start and just ask, from, from building out Mantra, what, what lessons have you learned about investor sentiment and market demand for tokenized real estate? Because I know that's something that you've, you've had a big focus on. What, how, does, how does Mantra aim to serve the demands of, of, of investors in that way? I, I think, like, um, you said tokenized real estate, but I'd like to broaden that a little bit, because um, as a chain being specifically built to bring real-world assets online, and people have said that it used to be called SEOs, I think in the next cycle it might be called something else, but tokenizing assets and representing on-chain is a multi-cycle problem that we're looking to solve. One of the primary blockers to being able to solve that is that you don't have a database on which uh, people can trust what's going on in terms of like the network effect of all of the issuers of assets that are coming on board. So right now, I think um, on the spectrum of tokenization, CJ's slide, and then there was also something from RWA.xyz, which says that um, if it is fungible and traceable in a Web2 world, it is easiest to tokenize. So we have stable coins that I would say that are real world assets and probably the first use case that we've had. Yeah. Similarly, on the other end of the spectrum, we have the promise of what uh, taking the largest asset in the world, which is real estate, and being able to provide liquidity, which doesn't currently exist in that ecosystem and fractionalizing it. I think for the people that we've been building with, the promise of that future and what that could look like is exciting enough that they're going to take this journey with us and probably run through many brick walls while we're trying to figure it out with uh, the regulators. But being in um, smaller, more agile regulatory environments that are keen to bring these uh, assets on chain is definitely a positive. And I can see that has changed over the last several years. And one of the things that they are happy to, about is that uh, when we're tokenizing assets, if it is an asset treated in the real world in a particular way, we're not saying we need to flip it on its head and change how we regulate it. All we're saying is that think of it as two-factor authentication for your business. There is a real-world methodology that you follow with a lot of paperwork and bureaucracy and processes. Now imagine if we were to make that more efficient in terms of settlements, executions, and whatever other way. So then you have on-chain provenance to prove that you have uh, this authenticity, while you also have existing off-chain processes that allow governments to feel comfortable. So it's about how do we take this evolutionary next step towards uh, finance becoming, like DeFi and TradFi coming together as finance, as opposed to being these two separate things that cannot mix together like oil and water. Okay. Now, you, you, mentioned, you mentioned regulation there, and mm -hmm. I do want to ask you a bit more about that in, in a moment or so. I want, I want to talk about compliance, because I know you guys at Mantra are very big on that. Um, but first, Joshua, can you, can you tell me where um, provenance fits into the RWA equation? Because, I mean, I, you know, looking at you guys, you guys have $12 billion in total value locked. Of 14 so, today. Four, <laughs> I stand corrected. <laughs> So yeah, where does, where does provenance fit into this? Yeah, so you know, provenance has been around since 2018 uh, via figure um, and then became its own uh, blockchain. We were one of the first adopters of uh, Cosmos SDK. And um, really what we've done is we've dove into the regulatory mud, if you will, and just had to figure it out piecemeal. And this is in the US regulatory environment. So some things that people may not be aware of that exist in the Cosmos ecosystem. So, as you mentioned, we've had 14 billion of uh, RWA TVL today. Now, what's interesting about that TVL is it's not digital twinned, it's digitally native TVL. And uh, in 2023, uh, there was about 20 billion, roughly, according to Reuters, uh, percent of those were done on provenance. So, it's the only asset class that we're aware of in blockchain. You could maybe talk about money markets or uh, you know, stable, something like this, treasuries. But it's the only asset class that we're aware of that's been truly disrupted by blockchain. So 12 of the top 20 mortgage lenders in the U.S. are now uh, doing HELOCs on provenance, Cosmos SDK chain. And not all of them wanted to, right? <laughs> it's the only asset class that's kind of like do or die because they were able to carve out 
uh, so many bips of savings in the tokenization process, in the ledgering process as those came onto provenance, uh, that people had to stand up and pay attention. And now today you have uh, figure markets, which has spun out. They have built the regulatory stack. So that's the ATS, money transmitters, uh, money transmitter licensing in all 50 states. And they've built out the everything market. You can go today to figure markets um, and you can begin to uh, cross-collateralize your RWAs, and these are AAA rated ABSs. These are, you know, regulated assets that exist on an ATS, and then begin to use those as collateral, you know, uh, to take out Bitcoin loans, Ethereum loans, uh, get leverage, etc. So, um, it's I, I believe the biggest thing in blockchain in, in terms of RWA uh, that's happened is right here in the Cosmos ecosystem. As a matter of fact, the the chart that CJ showed. Uh, on RWAXYZ, if you go look, there's a big blue wedge. That blue wedge is just provenance. And then underneath of that is everything else in the entire blockchain ecosystem, Ethereum, Solana, everywhere else. So by far the most real world assets in blockchain lives on Cosmos today. And who's your, who's your sort of target audience then? Is it, is it still those sophisticated investors that CJ and others have talked about earlier? Or do you feel that there is a, there, there is a larger retail market out there for you to target as well? Absolutely. We were talking earlier yep. today, and we're in complete agreement. I think we have a very similar view in the world in that we started off on the TradFi side, where a lot of RWA products start on the retail side. And there's very good reasons to start on either side but everything is going to meet in the middle eventually as regulatory clarity comes. And so we started off on TradFi, Apollo, Hamilton Lane, Neuberger Berman. Um, we worked with Axelar to do a POC with JP Morgan. Um, we did the first AAA rated AVS with Goldman Sachs and JP Morgan, et cetera. Uh, but Figure Markets is now pulling that towards the DeFi side. And I think we will end up seeing projects, you know, like, uh, you know, like Mantra and other projects like Plume, et cetera, begin to work alongside of everyone and start to meet in the middle. But I'll, I'll let you so, pick it up. And yeah, I mean, like, this is touching on a topic that we were chatting about earlier, where um, essentially, if we were to look at it, the technology exists today that tomorrow morning, a billion users can be supported by any blockchain, most blockchains out there. It, so it isn't, it isn't a blocker in terms of user uh, technology that needs to be scaled for us to be able to get more users. It's about actual utility. How are you making their life 10 times better? So while someone may be looking at it from the perspective of how do you make capital more efficient from an institutional point of view, the other one would be how do you make capital more accessible from a user point of view? So the idea is that whether you're a single user with like less than $100 to be able to spend, or whether you're an institution with $100 million to spend, we're reaching that stage in technological innovation where the same tech stack can be used for both. So it just comes down to stack four. Someone can use it for institutions, someone can use it for retail, but the ability to have that entire spectrum within one blockchain exists in the way that we're looking at it now. Yeah, and of course that, that massively widens the, the addressable market, you know, the, the pool of investors. So, uh, Georges, where does, where does Axelar fit into this then? Well, Mantra and Provenance tokenize assets. Axelar takes them everywhere. Right, just some examples that uh, Joshua mentioned. You have an asset that's tokenized on the provenance chain, but then you have other chains like Bloom Network, it's an Ethereum layer too, where you will be able to take a loan and get your real world assets. Maybe there's some incentives, maybe there's some unique structure, right? And you don't want to like take the loan on provenance itself. How do you move the asset over to do something on that uh, other market? And really our vision with Axelar, which has been the vision of Cosmos since the early days, that yeah. there's going to be a million chains its application will have its own chain, so those assets will need to move. If you want them to use product, if you want to use them productively, if you want to do things with them on interesting applications, you will need to move them around. And you need an interoperability solution like Axelar in order to be able to facilitate that. Another uh, interesting direction, I think, if you are a builder and you want to deploy your asset natively on multiple ecosystems, now we have all different kinds of VMs. We have the EVM, Solana VM, uh, Move, Aptos and Sui, yeah. we have Cosmosm. At least today, there's so much technical work in order to redeploy on many different chains. Many of these projects, they don't want to deploy a vanilla asset. They want to do all kinds of customizations. With Axelar, we provide the infrastructure so that you can deploy the asset anywhere you want and that the instances are connected. So you should be able to move the asset with zero slippage 
right? If it's a fungible asset, and use it everywhere. And uh, as a final example, last year at Project Guardian in um, Singapore, at Singapore, Singapore's FinTech Festival, which is the largest um, TradFi event, I believe, of the year in Singapore, uh, we did a proof of concept with JP Morgan and the provenance team, where one asset was tokenized on the provenance chain, another asset was tokenized on the permission JP Morgan on exchange, and you were able to do a cross-chain swap, which is the, the equivalent of a transaction they call DVP in TradFi, right? Mm -hmm. So all those things, TradFi is very interested in because everyone will have their own chain and you will need interoperability to connect them, otherwise the technology is unusable. I'm glad you mentioned TradFi, Georges, and I'm, I'm, because this is something, this is something we, um, my colleagues and I at Coin Bureau have talked about quite a lot. This, the, the RWA market, there is so much, so much potential there. Now, our TradFi institutions, and I believe um, Anthony from Midnight mentioned JP Morgan and Onyx Chain earlier. Now, our TradFi institutions, like JP Morgan, like BlackRock, are they going to want to tokenize assets on public blockchains that they have no control over? Or are they going to want to use their own permission chains, like Onyx, that, you know, these chains already exist. I mean, you know, you, it's perfectly easy to to uh, create a fork of Ethereum and use one of those. So why, why would they use public chains? Well, they want to get access to liquidity, right? Mm -hmm. All of the liquidity, all of the users are on the public chains. Um, for me, the question is more about timelines, not if it will happen, it's when. Um, in the history of the world, we've seen that superior technology always dominate, right? Because, you know, op free markets eventually just remove inefficiencies, right? And the most efficient right, open systems always dominate. So for a lot of these banks, and obviously I don't want to mention like specific names, but you have the option to either get disrupted, right? Mm -hmm. All behind or actually embrace the new technology. So for me, it's only a question of when it's going to happen. What is the time frame? It's not an if. And we already see a lot of appetite for people who are doing experiments on public blockchains. BlackRock actually tokenized on a public blockchain. So if their competitors don't do the same, they are going to fall uh, behind, right? So there's a lot of forces in this direction. Hopefully it happens super, sooner rather than later, but it's definitely going to happen, right? Eventually, everything is going to converge to public chains. Yeah. If I can take a stab at this, because this is also, you know, one of the core strengths of Cosmos and the IVC is that there's going to be everything in between. You're going to see public blockchains, you're going to see private blockchains, and you're going to see what we call properly permissioned um, blockchains, and they're going to be connected everywhere. But the one thing that blockchain is good at, and our stance at Providence is blockchain is only really good at one thing, and that's displacing, uh, you know, truth uh, with trust, or trust with truth. And uh, if you have a private blockchain, you're having to still trust that entity, and you have no truth there. Now, that's fine. We trust our assets with many different entities, and we'll continue to do that at scale and at you know, uh, different you know, rates. But uh, the moment that you need to you know, truly be trusted, that's when you'll want to push a button like Axelar or IBC, bring assets off of your private construct and onto a mainnet, whether that's Provenance or Mantra or any of the other you know, regulated RWA chains that exist out there. So you're going to see both, and this is where the Cosmos ethos and the Cosmos uh, um, philosophy, I think, has proven out with L2s, Cosmos ecosystem, et cetera, is that people do need to have these private blockchain constructs, but they can't only live on a private blockchain construct. And privacy is something you can also get on a public chain yep. as well, right? So you get all of the good properties plus, you know, plus the privacy. privacy. But That's right. I just, I just wanted to add on to the why would TradFi banks like JP Morgan want to use public blockchains? JP Morgan is a market leader. They don't need to do anything. It is the incumbents or the people that are trying to play catch up with them that are going to try and innovate in this space. So as a market leader, it is your responsibility to hold your fort. It doesn't matter how you do it. So up until the fact that JP Morgan's dominance is uh, actually in danger from all of these other funds and banks that are tokenizing it, they're not going to make any change. But at some point in time, how important is composability and how important is uh, having the money building blocks within your bank? Until that question is answered, there's no reason for banks to want to move to public <laughs> blockchains.
but there is a point in time in which that without public blockchains, you can't communicate with the rest of the world. It's like saying, I have a website that only I can see. It doesn't help anyone. So yeah. we need to have blockchains that other people can see. Otherwise, what are you interacting with? Yeah. They're going to be, they'll, they'll be familiar with the, with the concept of, trust me, bro. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, and, and Jay, that brings me back to what I wanted to ask you about compliance, because obviously, for, I think if there's been kind of uh, one overarching theme in crypto more generally this year, I think it's been the fact that TradFi is adopting, you know, it has, is coming to the space quicker and quicker. And I think that, you know, ETFs in the United States are the best, best example of that. But there are many more. But obviously, TradFi is... is obsessed with compliance um, and lots of you know large areas of the crypto space are waking up to the importance of that as well you guys have worked a lot on compliance so what you know how does that what does that look like what 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 work have you done in the compliance space so I think specifically uh, from the compliance angle it's to understand why self-custodied assets in the crypto world has just not taken off as the way that we had imagined right mm -hmm. It's just that when you take on money from other people and then you have to return the money to them, you want to be as careful as you possibly can. Yeah. So it's about being cautious with other people's money, which is why we need compliance. And the way that we've been looking at compliance is that um, I've been in crypto for a while and I used to think of it as the bad word that we don't want to do. Uh, but given all of the fun stuff that happened in 2022, it just became relevant to me that there is a pragmatic way in which that we can bring users and assets on chain while also being able to provide some level of oversight to them. So at that level, we've realized that trying to enforce compliance at a blockchain level or at a DAP level may be hard. So similar to how you have your current KYCs or KYBs that are happening that are associated with your identity in some form in the real world, even on chain, we can have that identity in place and then be able to represent it as a way that there is an off-chain identity check that has taken place so that if something were to go wrong, there is regulatory oversight that we can fall back on and legal recourse. But given everything else that you have on chain, you're just a pseudonymous wallet address that's allowed to do some transactions and be able to participate in this ecosystem. So until there's a check-in measure that we need to do in the real world, there is no reason for us to open up this Pandora's box of uh, compliance. But that also means that the main reason I believe, and this is a personal opinion, that users are not coming in en masse into this ecosystem is because of their fear, uncertainty, and doubt. Mm -hmm. So up until you have a trusted ecosystem like a regulator, transfer trust to a trustless ecosystem, there is no users that are going to come on board. So from that perspective, we're like, let's not try to hope for what I want to see the world in 10 years from now. Let's work with what the world is today. And that means, like, let's bring an on-chain representation that can eventually morph into something more uh, passportable across various blockchains, also using different use cases to bring users on board. Yeah. Okay. So just to, just to close this out, I want to ask all three of you what you uh, individually see as the biggest challenges for the RWA sector. We've talked about, and other panels before us have talked about the opportunities there. Um, you know, we, we called this panel the $30 trillion opportunity, I think. You know, and we are talking in terms of trillions of dollars. So this thing seems inevitable, uh, in the sort of longer run, I guess. But what are the biggest What are the biggest challenges it faces to to mainstream adoption and to mainstream acceptance? Is it Is it competition? Is it regulation? Is it concerns around security? Georges, can I? Start regulation with you? is definitely uh, a big one, and we see a lot of pushback, right, in, in many big jurisdictions. So my hope really is that you know we see jurisdictions like uh, you know Singapore and Hong Kong are very progressive. Right, I think the Project Guardian that uh, is annually organized by the MAS in Singapore is a first of its kind, right? Like just seeing a, a regulatory authority of a country organizing like a blockchain focused initiative and providing guidance to the various institutions. Uh, I think this is very unique. Also here, right, in, uh, in the Emirates, uh, I actually just moved here uh, very recently. Some of the other panelists uh, were talking about how easy it is, how friendly, the countries uh, towards uh, Web3 innovators. And I think as a first step, we need some of those countries, some of those jurisdictions to embrace the technology. And then, as you were saying earlier, you know, then, you know, the, some of the bigger regulatory entities uh, are also going to have to, you know, play catch up and then that's how you get adoption, right? So my hope is really, you know, regulation is, is hard, but we need some jurisdictions to embrace 
crypto, and then everyone else will have to naturally follow. First, slowly. Joshua, and, and uh, are you, do you feel the same way? Is it, is it regulation that's the biggest challenge? I, I think it's three things. Regula regulation being a massive one. Um, you know, even if things get solved in Dubai, and I agree, Dubai is a very crypto-friendly nation, but, you know, you have, like, crazy problems. Like, even if you are in Dubai and you want to originate an asset, and then a validator, a U.S. validator, is the one that approves that transaction at the time of origination, there's legal opinion that you're now under U.S. jurisdiction, even if you don't want to be, even if everything is in Dubai. So there's, there's lots of regulatory hurdles that you're going to have to piecemeal across many, many jurisdictions, not just Dubai, not just Singapore, not just the U.S. The second piece, I think, is distribution. We've heard that from GSR earlier. Like, where's the money come from? Where's the buy side? And the last one, I believe, is one of the biggest across retail and TradFi. Um, my day job, I'm, I'm CEPO for uh, Cody. And uh, we're working on privacy uh, for blockchain via a technique called garbled circuits. And I chose to go there from Providence because privacy, as we heard earlier from Cardano uh, Project Midnight, it's the biggest blocker from retail and uh, TradFi coming on. Until there's on-chain privacy at scale, at speed, and cost efficiency, uh, you're not going to be able to meet the regulations. All of those regulatory bodies are going to force everything to go into private blockchain constructs like Canton, like, uh, you know, uh, private zones on, um, uh, on Cosmos. So it's, you know, regulation, distribution, and privacy. Okay. Jay, final uh, word to you. I mean, they've said all the things that were on the top of my mind. So instead of looking at it from an industry level, I'm going to go way more granular. And I'm just going to say that in addition to regulation, in addition to um, distribution and inventory being brought on board, I think one of the biggest blockers is just awful user experience when it comes to using blockchains. Yeah. Because to be honest, every time I go to use my bank account in Hong Kong, I think, yes, crypto is the way forward. Now imagine that we're telling people that here is this elaborate new way to make your life more difficult because you get to self-custody your assets. Most people don't care about being their own bank. They care about having an experience that is 10 times better and more reliable than what they have right now. So as an industry, until we get to that stage, regulation is far away because we're asking regulators that have 10 to 15 year time horizons to do something for our users. Our users need cheap dopamine. They want it fixed now. <laughs> Imagine you have to wait three seconds because your Netflix isn't buffering. How mad are you with that? So imagine now if I have to wait five seconds for my money to buffer. I wouldn't want to wait for that. So yeah. user experience. Yeah, very, very wise words. And yeah, I mean, we're asking for, we're crying out for regulations for a sector that is, that is still very much being built. You know, we're still, at the, I guess, at the foundational stage in a way um, in terms of what we what we want to achieve, what is possible to achieve, and what we can offer the user. Because as you say, Jay, it's not an, it's not an optimal experience yet. Yet. Mm. But I do believe that we can build towards that future. Yeah. Because uh, imagine using the internet or a computer in the early 90s versus what it is right now. So we still haven't had that moment where that uh, innovation has compounded. We're still a relatively new industry. And a lot of people say that we're an industry looking for a use case. No, we're a database looking for a use case. So that's, that's <laughs> I do have to make the point, though, to Jay's point. The reason why Providence gained $14 billion in TVL was because you can go to figure lending right now if you're a U.S.-based resident. You can apply for a second mortgage, and typically that second mortgage takes 30 to 45 days. There's a huge cost to the warehouse, to the lending process. You can go today, and figure has been able to compress that timeline down to five days uh, because of uh, it being ledgered on blockchain. And so go get a U.S. ELOC. You've got grandmothers and their Gen Z counterparts getting assets on a blockchain without understanding that they're touching blockchain. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, one, one phrase that always sticks with me is that something easily had isn't worth having. So tokenized, tokenized assets on, on blockchains, tokenized real estate, whatever it might be, is a huge prize. You know, we always talk in the trillions of dollars. There is still a lot of work to do, but it's going to be worth, it's going to be worth it when we get there. And gentlemen, I think everything that you're working on is, is, is pushing us in that direction. So keep it up. Thank you.